welcome to Stirring the Pot podcast, a podcast all about discussing controversial food subjects, historical aspects of food, and pretty much everything else food and cooking related. Let me start by introducing my co-host. First, we have Mr. Barbecue Brand, an aficionado of all things barbecue and an overall lover of food and culture. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What's cooking, everybody? Barbecue brand here. Let's get it cracking. <laughs> My second co-host, Mr. Brandon D., a connoisseur of Louisiana and Southern cuisine and a self-proclaimed food science nerd. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the podcast, everybody listening. We're about to start off with some topics and show you all what we're thinking and let's get it started. All right. I am your host, Casey P. I'm a baking enthusiast and a lover of all the history behind Southern culture and cuisine. Tonight's topic is a rather contentious one. We're going to start off with gumbo tonight. So to start us off, I'm going to start with a little article on a short history of gumbo by Stanley Dry. Of all the dishes in the realm of Louisiana cooking, gumbo is the most famous and very likely the most popular. Gumbo crosses all class barriers, appearing on the tables of the poor as well as the wealthy. Although ingredients might vary greatly from one cook to the next and from one part of the state to another, a steaming bowl of fragrant gumbo is one of life's cherished pleasures, as emblematic of Louisiana as chili is to Texas. Gumbo is often cited as an example of the melting pot nature of Louisiana cooking. But trying to sort out the origins and the evolutions of the dish is highly speculative. The name derives from a West African word for okra, suggesting that gumbo was originally made with okra. The use of filé, dried and ground sassafras leaves, was a contribution of the Choctaws and possibly other local tribes. Roux has its origin in French cuisine, although roux use in gumbos is much darker than its French cousins. Dr. Carl A. Brasso of the University of Louisiana Lafayette, who has written the definitive history of the Cajuns, found that the first documented references to gumbo appeared around the turn of the 19th century. In 1803, gumbo was served at a governor's reception in New Orleans. And in 1804, gumbo was served at a Cajun gathering on the Acadian coast. With that being said, let's start our discussion. Well, 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 gumbo, one of the most controversial, contentious topics in Louisiana. As much BS and mystery and voodoo that people think's behind it, it's not that complicated of a dish. It's actually a very simple concept. There's been so much said about gumbo and everybody. And a real big thing I like about that article is the regional take on gumbo. Gum gumbo is a highly regional dish. Uh, you know, people that live closer to the coast, uh, say like in New Orleans and Terrebonne Parish, would be in a Cajun, uh, mostly Cajun parish. Uh, the ingredients are just different. And they, they, they use a lot more crab. They use a lot more shrimp. Whereas somebody from like, uh, say like nor uh, a little further north, like Opelousas, might use just chicken and sausage, more pork. So it, it's, a, it's a very regional dish. You know, there's controversies about all this. You know, every, you know, I'm sure I'm going to piss everybody's grandmother off talking about this subject because my mama did this and my mama did that. It's all up in the air. Everybody has a different thing and everybody. And that's the thing about gumbo. It's really something that you have to adapt to your own taste. If you don't like certain ingredients, you don't use them. If you don't like a heavy smoked sausage, you don't use a heavy smoked sausage. If you, if you like duck instead of chicken then you use duck there's really no rules but the the main rule for a roux gumbo is it has to have meat there's no such thing as vegetarian gumbo it does not exist it has not existed it will not mm -hmm. I, in a in a roux form I, I don't think it can exist in a in an okra form maybe you could pull off a vegetarian gumbo but in, in, a, in a roux form the roux is really meant to complement meat flavors and i think that's one of the most important things so there's a lot to talk about with gumbo. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. So there are there are no rules in gumbo. It you know as far as your flavor combinations and your mm, flavor right. profiles that exactly. you prefer. But there are some unwritten rules 
And we can definitely talk about that today because I've been seeing a whole lot of buffoonery going on <laughs> with people making pots of gumbo around here. Let's call it what it is. Let's get this Buff thing started. There's buffoonery. Some stuff going on. Buffoonery, ch it. chicanery, tomfoolery, whatever you want to call it. You're right. There are rules. Like, that's the thing about gumbo. You, you The person really, uh, they take the flavor of the gumbo and they adapt it to their, their palate. But the rules of cooking roux, the rules of cooking okra, these are pretty solidly established. They take a certain process. They take a certain amount of time. And there's, re and there's really, there's ways to shortcut it, but they're generally make cooking the cooking process more intensive than just doing it the long. It's going to take a lot of time to do gumbo. You're not going to get it done in an hour. It just doesn't work that way. Cooking roux takes a long time to break down and, and form your emulsion. Really, it's a, this is my food science nerd. It's a colloid. So it's an emulsion. It's suspended with fat and particles. The starch particles make a colloid. So it takes a while to form that with heat. And so that's, that's really what you're doing. And okra itself, okra takes a certain amount of time to cook to break down. So you don't, you're not cooking a pot of slime because that is definitely gumbo sin number one. Slimy gumbo. Nobody wants a slimy gumbo. And Casey, I want no. to get your point on this too, or your take on this. But I, so one of the things you brought up a really good point as far as a lot of the different components that go into gumbo and why it makes it what it is. And with competition barbecue and, and, and catering that I do, barbecue in general, you need to know what each component does for your dish. And that's something that lacks in Southern cooking is that we just take recipes that has been handed down and handed down and we do things based on tradition versus based on knowledge about what's happening. So right. based, based, based on like it's gospel and it's not, right. it's, it's just, I think part of this podcast is trying to expand people's knowledge on why food works the way it does and why things work and what you can do. And there's a lot that goes into gumbo and every part of it has a particular uh, you know, purpose. So it's a really, it's a very complex dish. It really is, but it's not a difficult dish. It's just, you have to follow the rules. Casey, we put ravioli in gumbo, gumbo or not? What are we doing? Oh, no, 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 no. There, no. Yeah, there, are, there are rules, there are unwritten rules to these things. Like you can't put ravioli. No and, pasta in gumbo. And, 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 and three, you can't put corn on the cob either. Yeah, you know, let's, like, let's they, yeah. There's, there's certain vegetables that go in, and then there's then there are some that do not. Okay, let, let's say it, corn. No, corn does not go in gumbo. Not in Louisiana gumbo at no. ever, no. At, no. ever. The, there is the, no corn in gumbo. No. no. Yes, yes. There is. It is. It is one hundred percent forbidden to call yeah. put corn in Louisiana gumbo. And the only like starch used with gumbo should be right so like as a compliment not as like an additive it's 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 to, it's basically like a vehicle for your gumbo you know it's 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 not an ingredient in your gumbo it's just a compliment to it it's, you know it's, it's just yeah. the vehicle to get it from your bowl to your mouth <laughs> right from your bowl it's, to your mouth it's a it's, it's a <laughs> it's a filler it's like it's like uh you know it's like potatoes and beef stew it's just the it's it's not really there to add any flavor, it basically, all it really does is just, it makes you full. So that's what rice is in gumbo. It's a filler and it absorbs the liquid and it's delicious. So, Hey, it all works. Right. Yeah. There's, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of dishes that we eat that have fillers in it, you know? It's, right. Right. Oh it's, yeah. It's, a, it's necessary. It's necessary. It is. And, um, well, I, I won't say necessary, but it's, you know, it's allowed and it's fine. It's well, you know, yeah, gumbo is a food that's made to stretch. I mean, it's 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 made for rich rich people make it, poor people make it, and when poor people make it, it's it's poverty food. I mean, you make it what you have on hand, and you try to stretch it as much as you as you possibly can. And adding mm -hmm. rice, rice and gumbo, you, we all know we eat a, you know you add a you make a thick gumbo and you add rice to it, you're gonna be full. <laughs> yes, and so very full. So I think this is where people go wrong is that they 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 use gumbo as a freezer dump. And we should not be doing this. That's this is where all this ravioli <laughs> right, and corn right. and all no. this other crap come from. Leave that out of the gumbo, okay? Let's yeah, do it. it's not no. green meat and corn and ravioli gumbo. No, no, no. I mean, like, it, look, there, there can't be too many animals in it. You know, you cross over three animals, you got to start questioning yourself. You right. know, <laughs> and let's let's be honest. It should not have, like 
you wash the dishes in the sink. That oh is, yeah, well that, that's it's that's not like dirty water. That Whoa. that's that's and that's Whoa. that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna go over. You know, we're gonna talk about this. <laughs> Let's separate gumbo. In, in in my in where I'm from, and my parents are from, my parents and grandparents. There was two separate gumbos. There was okra gumbo and there was roux gumbo, and these things did not mix. Now, my we did put a little bit of roux in the okra gumbo for color and a little bit of flavor, but it was way less. We're talking a tenth of the amount of roux that goes in a roux gumbo. Very, very small amount. In my world, they're separate things. In other people's world, they make hybrid gumbos. They'll make a, a gumbo with more roux and okra. And, they'll, and the thing about it is you could balance it, but you, ha- you can't make a... You can't take like your roux recipe gumbo and add okra to it because it's going to be a thick mess. It's it's really like a conflicting textures uh, almost I would say. You don't it would be too thick. So you don't want to make an okra gumbo with the same amount of roux. If you want to mix those two, they have to be mixed in proportion to each other to where your product is actually something that's palatable because otherwise it would just be a thick mess. You can't use right. good start off for a roux gumbo is about a cup of roux per gallon will get you there. It might be a little bit on the thick side, but the thing about gumbo is when it's cooked, when you've made your gumbo and it's cooked and it's all done, you can actually thin it out with hot water. If it's too thick, you just add hot water until it's the consistency you make it. So that's a good tip right there. I'm pretty sure a lot of people yes. don't know that. Or oh, I, I didn't know that because the first time I cooked gumbo, I tell this story. Look, the first time I cooked gumbo, uh, I got charged with cooking the Christmas Eve gumbo at my grandmother's house. And I looked at my dad. My grandmother was in the hospital at the time. I looked at my dad. Dad said, who's cooking the gumbo? I know we're having gumbo. Who's cooking it? And when my dad looks at me and says, you? I was like, I never cooked gumbo in my life before. <laughs> so here I get tasked with cooking the biggest gumbo of the year. You know, I, I don't know what I... Burst pipes, one of the two. Yeah, it's exactly. I, I know, I know, I've seen my mom do it. I know the process. So, I, you know, start with the onions and the celery and the, the peppers, put it in the water, the stock, add the roulette that cook. And then I let it cook and it's reducing. And I'm like, man, this is getting really thick. What do I do? Well, you know, and I didn't know what I was doing. So I was, you know, the gumbo's done. I know when it's done because... There, we'll talk about this later, how you can tell what gumbo is done. I know it's done. It tastes, I taste it as like, man, it's really intense and thick and a little bit on the saltier side than I would like. Everybody eats it and, you know, they're like, oh, it's good. And my mom comes over. She was somewhere else. She comes over a little later. She comes over when the gumbo is done and she, she looks at it. She's like, oh, it's a little thick. She tastes it. She's like, oh, it's a little salty. So she said, oh, watch this. So she, she gets out of kettle, heats up about a liter of hot water, pours it in. <laughs> and and says needs a little bit more, pours a little bit more after that, and then it's fixed. And it's like it's perfect after that. And I was like, what did you do? She's like, oh, I just added hot water. This is the beginning of my cooking career. I don't, you know, I don't know that much. She said, yeah, you can thin out gumbo with hot water. I was like, really? No Ooh. clue of that. <laughs> but you can wow. thin it out. It's it's easier to thin out a thick gumbo than it is to thicken a thin gumbo. Mm, that's why that's I say for, that. That's why I always say. If you're going to start off, it's better to start off a little thick because you can thin it out. Like if it's too thin, then you start getting into some some things that are a little tricky and you can thicken it up, but it makes it much, much more difficult. Mm-hmm. And then that is probably throw, the things that you can thicken it up with are the are the process of thickening it up. It's probably going to throw off your textures and probably it's add very, cooking time. Yeah, it definitely will add cooking time. It'll definitely change the texture. You'll, basically, what you would have to do is... Uh, is you'd have to short cook a roux in like a small volume of water and try not to burn it and then add that to your. So you'd have to take a certain amount of roux, let's say like a cup and cook it in probably about four cups of water. And you Mm -hmm. could break it down real fast like that. I mean, you could do it in probably 20, 30 minutes, but you're going to run a real large risk of of scorching it. You could not step away from it for a second. All I can hear in my head is, ooh, my stomach bubbling. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes, and that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that's and, and and that's I guess I guess how we should start. You know, it's just like you know we start talking about like a classic a classic roux gumbo, and and really like one of my friends told me this, and this changed the changed the way I looked at gumbo is when you're making like a chicken and sausage gumbo, you focus on chicken. Chicken is the star of the dish right there. Chicken and sausage, so use mm-hmm. good quality chicken good quality sausage, and good quality stock. 
because stock is really what builds the gumbo. Uh, quality you know, you, ingredients will carry a dish a very long way. Yes, yes, indeed. And a good stock, a homemade stock, is far superior to anything bone broth, chicken stock, whatever you buy in the store. Absolutely. It's not very difficult to make. It's a, there's a bunch of recipes on it. It's an easy, easy recipe. It just takes bones and time. That's all. It, that's all it takes to make a good stock. When, when I had that interview with the Food Network, they were asking me about about gumbo. They were from up north, so they asked me what was one of the main, uh, you know, the main components of gumbo, and I told them time. You gotta yes. allow for yes. everything to marry and come together and break down and come back together after it breaks down. It's, it's a process, and it's actually better after it's been refrigerated and reheated, one hundred percent. Every time. It's it's just such a complex dish. A lot of people talk about roux, and roux is important. It is very important that your roux is properly cooked, not burnt, into the color that you want. Because hold while on, everybody's hold on, B. Hold on. Hold on, B. I, yeah. I, I got a, I got a question for you because you just touched on something we need to talk about. <laughs> oh yeah. You just said What's the that? color you just said the color of roux. Yes. So <laughs> I, I'm gonna give this this little bit. This little tidbit, and I and I want to get your I want to get both of your opinions on this. But I work in education, and we have something called exposure bias. So students can only be interested in things that they have been exposed to. So they're Correct. only they have exposure bias. Until you expose them to more things, you can't really expect them to have an interest in something else, right? I think right. down south we have palate bias especially when it comes to the color of our gumbo the root right color right what's your take on exactly. that well yeah that's true i mean most most people like in in south louisiana in our region where we're from which is south south uh, western louisiana south central louisiana area most gumbos go from a brick which is like a reddish root all the way down to like uh the really dark root almost black roots and we really don't go lighter than that. But there's now you, you can't make a white roux gumbo. That would make no sense. <laughs> the color of your roux is really up to you. You could go with a lighter roux. In fact, if you're making a butter roux, you can only go so dark. You can only take a butter roux as far as you can brown butter. So if it's past the color of brown butter, it is burnt. So there's only so far you can go with roux with a butter. So that's there, there's there's rules. There's rules of roux. There's rules of color. And there's rules of fats that you can use in certain things. And uh, I actually have a, a diagram, if you want me to share that. Yeah, yeah, let's take a look at it. Because I'm, uh, uh, let me see, share. Okay. This is, this is, this is true. You know, uh, you know, as my, I make, di I, I, Science. I make diagrams for a living. So, I mean, that's, you got a, you got, a, you have a room color diagram. Yes, I did. At your disposal right now? This is crazy. At my disposal <laughs> right now, man. I made this. I made this because I knew we were going to talk about it. Uh, there we go. Coming up. It's, it's coming up. Oh, what is this? I this is what I. This, before. <laughs> this is right, what I call the, the the rules of color. Go ahead, B. No, no. So just for 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 any of our listeners who are listening on a platform where you can't see us, B has put up a diagram of root color starting from the lightest to the darkest correct so we're about to talk about this so basically you go from light to dark as you go from light to dark so going from left to right on the scale your flavor com complexity increases when you go to a really dark room you're talking about real complex flavors nutty bitter flavors and and that's what makes gumbo super savory is the bitter flavors but also as you go from light to dark your thickening power reduces so your darker roux have the least amount of thickening power. And also, as you go from light to dark, your cooking time increases. So those really dark roux take a really long time to break down in water and form your gumbo. So your choice of color is really up to you. Some people can't stomach really dark roux. Really dark roux hurt a lot of people's stomachs. They can't, they can't eat it. So they may make a lighter roux because it's easier on their stomach. Dark roux can be kind of... That's why a bad gum, uh, an improper cooked gumbo will give you a, a really bad case of indigestion. Horrible. Some mm -hmm. of the worst you'll ever have in your life. So this scale is meant to show you that as, as your considerations as you go from light to dark. So white would be the bechamel, 
the absolute farthest on the right would be your dark, your super dark gumbos, you know, really dark, long cooked times. You know, what would people think of Cajun gumbos? And then a step above that is a little bit in between. I kind of float between the, the uh, I'd say the last, uh, the, the second, the third to the and second with the last one from the right. So that's kind of my, the way I float in. I don't really do super dark roux. It's, it's not really my thing. It works for some people and really it's up to you. What's important about gumbo is not really your roux color. It's really how you've cooked it and how long you've cooked it. It, color is one is a great you want dark root make dark root but you have to consider these considerations on the list as you make darker gumbo you hear that people? i have a question i want to get both of you's take on on this so what do you think what ingredient goes best with what color like as far as gumbo is concerned not like the lighter root on this scale but like let's say mid to the darkest what ingredients go best with what? Like people that maybe not understand those kind of things. That is a good, good question. Wow. Um, it's a good one. Yes, that is. So I'm not, I don't eat a lot of really dark root gumbos. Most of the gumbo that I've had in my life are usually in that mid to that mid range. And then the next mm -hmm. color, the next color over. As far as in, the ingredients that go best with it, I think, and I just love a good chicken and sausage gumbo with a, a slightly lighter roux. This is, and this is just my opinion, but mm -hmm. I think I'm there. If it's going to be a seafood gumbo, we hadn't talked about seafood gumbo. No, we haven't. Seafood gumbo I like with a darker roux. Yes. 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 And I like chicken and sausage with a lighter root. Lighter. You know, it'd be I'm gonna come back behind you and agree with you. There's a color of roux that they call brick, where it gets this reddish brown, mm -hmm. and I really think that's that's really the darkest I take my roux for chicken and sausage gumbo. I don't like a dark roux with chicken and sausage gumbo. Right. I think right. that I think the really potent bitter flavors of it for my palate it doesn't match best with chicken. Because like when I when I focus on chicken and sausage gumbo, I really really focus on chicken. I really make a I make a really really rich stock, a really rich homemade chicken stock, and that's and I really want that chicken flavor to come forward, and I really don't want it to be kind of conflicting with the darker roux. Now I've had chicken and sausage gumbo with darker roux, and they are good, but this is all mm -hmm. personal preference. If your roux's not dark, you're not making gumbo. That's just one hundred percent incorrect. B, I'll tell you this, the last, the last gumbo we made together, that uh, chicken and sausage gumbo did have a slightly darker roux to it. You know, it was a darker hue. Mm. But if that gumbo wasn't top three that I've ever had, top, I, was, I'm uh, going to go out on a limb and say it's the top three gumbo I've ever had. And it ain't three. <laughs> <laughs> it was very, it was very good, and we made that gumbo for a, a barbecue competition. But like you're saying, the, the palate bias. I felt they were judging the gumbo on what they expect, and not for what it was. And that's mm -hmm. really, and that's really doing a disservice to food, because when you when you taste something, you should try to taste something with an open mind. You okay. shouldn't close it off. Well, this is not how my grandmother did it. Well, maybe that's how somebody else, else's grandmother did it. You don't have to do it like. Not everybody does things the same way. So there's going to be a different, you know, methodology for everybody's cooking. So in my family, we never made really dark uh, chicken and sausage gumbos. Casey, I'm going to let you so. go, but um, I'm going to go ahead and say this. Since this is stirring the pot, a lot of people are very biased to their family's cooking and you know, right. the recipes that they, they were handed down from their grandmas and their grandpas, which I completely respect. But I'm going to go ahead and say it right now. I've had some of y'all grandparents cooking and it ain't all that. So maybe you need to explore some things and uh, go outside of the box and taste some things uh, beyond you're, you're, your family cooking. Yeah, right. Your grandmother is not the end all and be all of cooking knowledge. I'm sorry to tell you that, but no. she's not. Everybody has a different take on it. Like I've seen people make gumbo without celery. And personally, I think skipping, if you skip celery and gumbo, you're missing out on quite a bit. It's really, really an important ingredient. And another thing I, I like to say about gumbo is, is the chop of your vegetables, your onions, mm. your peppers, and your celery. The chop is supposed to be a fine chop. You do not rough chop vegetables for gumbo. 
I was just it, it, you're not, you want to chop it a fine to a fine dice because really what you're doing is you're increasing the surface area and you're getting more flavor out of the same amount of ingredient by increasing the surface area by chopping it small. Mm -hmm. I want to circle back and go back to the colors of the rule real quick and talk about how we we pretty much agree across the board here that a lighter like chicken and sausage is for a lighter I'm not talking on the way end of the right hand, the left hand side of the, the scale, but like in that middle, with that kind of reddish brown. Right. I mm. think that is definitely the lane for chicken and sausage because if you go any darker, you get those bitter notes from the darker mm. root, right? But that middle lane right there, you still are going to get all your bitter notes from your herbs that you're adding that help to complement the chicken. So mm -hmm. you don't want to have bitter on bitter. And that's what happens when you go darker with the chicken and sausage. Because with chicken, chicken is a great flavor. Poultry does really well complementing with, with herbs and spices. So you want to make sure you, you are highlighting that and not hiding it with right. the bitter, darker root flavors. Now, what I find interesting is that seafood works better with the darker flavors, the darker root. It does. Yep. It, seafood just stands up. Now, I'm sorry. I'm going to be very controversial on what I'm about to say. Crawfish does not go in gumbo. No, it does not. No. That's crawfish stew. That's a different thing. And crawfish stew is 100% delicious. It is great. I love crawfish stew. But crawfish tends to overwhelm it's seafood too much gumbo. Of, yeah, it's too it's much It's too of a distinct. flavor. Right, right. Mm -hmm. right. It's, and that's... And that's that's 100% correct. Crawfish is too strong to go in a seafood gumbo. When you have things that are real delicate and sweet, like crab and shrimp, right. real light, delicate flavors, they really don't pair well with, with crawfish. It's just, yeah. it's, it's conflicting. It's like it's a, it is. Craw, like one of my friends said, crawfish tastes like fresh water, and it does. That's what it tastes like. It tastes like something from fresh water. Whereas the, with the shrimp and the crab, you get that briny kind of sweet kind of, uh, brackish water kind of salty flavor to it so mm -hmm. crawfish doesn't really pair well in my opinion doesn't pair well with with and, and seafood gumbo i think it's just too much now what I, now let me see somebody served me a seafood gumbo with crawfish would i eat it absolutely i just think it kind of hides the shrimp and that's it's, and that's yeah. and that's a problem and that's the thing about rue i want people to think about rue think of a painting rue is what you is 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 it's like the framing of a house or the canvas of a painting it's what you put flavors on. You build flavors on roux, but the roux is there to complement flavors, and roux really intensifies meat flavors. Meat flavors and gumbo and roux gumbo are really that's really where roux shines. It it amplifies meat flavors because it's bitter. It's bitter and nutty and complex, and it really amplifies meat flavors. Like I say with gumbo, the flavor profile of gumbo is very narrow. It is not sweet. It's not tangy not sour it is 100 percent savory it is mm -hmm. all savory flavors the flavor profile is very narrow it's like this very narrow it's very all deep. Sit, but it's deep very deep flavors it's the deep it's one of the most intensely savory things you can eat it, it yep. really is and the, really the only thing that brightens up uh, a, a gumbo is you know the little bit of herbs you put in there a little bit of parsley a little bit of uh you know, whatever herbs that you desire to use. I like to use poultry seasoning and, and chicken and sausage gumbo. Really brings a nice, it really lifts that chicken flavor out and really gives it a nice compliment. Uh, Chef Paul Perdome's uh, poultry magic, perfect. Poultry magic, yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, and, th that and also cayenne pepper is a super important ingredient in gumbo as well. Mm -hmm. It gets just that cayenne, it gives that nice background heat. Not too forward on your tongue, on the back of your palate. You know, you should never... Taste the gumbo and say, "Oh, that's spicy." You should. It should build up after a few a few spoonfuls. And when yeah. you when you're done eating it, you should say, "Man, that was that was a little spicy, but it was good." You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't have that that real burn. You know, when I I think of like or something that has a real forward spicy thing, I think of something like uh like Thai food or Malaysian food that has a real that has a real zing to it. You taste that heat right off the bat. But even that even that has to have balance in it. And they know how to balance those flavors really well. You know what the ingredients they choose to cook with. Man, I'm telling you right now, I'm getting hungry. All this talk about gumbo. I know, man. Gumbo. 
Oh, yeah, that's another thing. Gumbo oh. is definitely not a summertime food. No, no, <laughs> no. So I have this little, this little book. It's called The Little Gumbo Book by Gwen McKee. And there's a little section right here. Uh, this is all about Ruth. So I want to read a little something from that just to kind of touch on what we're talking about. It mm -hmm. says, um, a roux is simply a mixture of flour and fat cooked and stirred until it is brown. Slowly heating the flour breaks up the starch molecules and reduces its thickening power while giving it a unique scorched flavor at the same time. The degree mm. of doneness is determined by the color, which gets darker the longer it is cooked. Every imaginable brown color comparison has been used to describe roux, mahogany, coffee, pecan. Just thought that was a really mm. interesting little on yeah. color. That, that, that is, right, that is right. really cool. Um, you almost can't talk about food without diving into science. It's oh, yeah. No, no, the you can't. The more you understand and the more you try to understand food and what's happening at different parts of the cooking process, you just start getting into science. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. And the more you know, the better food you cook. That's, I believe that. Right. <laughs> right, right. The, I mean, that's... <laughs> Yeah, so, and then, and it's real important with gumbo. It's real important to understand the rules. The, the gumbo, the roux, the darker it is, the more time it takes to break down that, that roux and to, and to form your emulsion colloidal solution to, to make it taste, to make it a cohesive dish. And it takes time. And there's no, there's no real shortcutting it. That I'm not going to say there's, there's, there's ways to shortcut it, and I'll explain those. But you ultimately increase, increase the difficulty of your cook. So let's say I'm going to start, if I want to cook gumbo faster, a roux faster, the way you could do it is reducing the water volume. Because that reduces, when you add water, all you're doing is adding heat capacity to whatever you're cooking. Water right. takes an enormous amount of energy to heat up. So mm -hmm. is to get that heat energy into the roux, if you have a big volume of water, it's going to take longer to break down the roux. If you reduce the water volume down, you'll have to, you'll put heat energy into the roux faster and you'll cook it faster. But you'll also increase your risk of scorching it by a huge margin mm. because that roux will fall to the bottom, it'll stick and it'll burn and you'll be stirring, you'll be stirring that constantly for hours. I mean, I, let's say you can reduce your time by half. You reduce it from two to four, but you're stirring constantly for two hours rather than just sitting back and watching it. So, yeah, if it's your if choice, it's, if it's one thing I hate is and I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I'm watching a cooking show and somebody has 30 or 45 minutes to make a dish and they say, oh, I'm going to make gumbo. Oh, my. no, no. And then they do it. They do it. And then the people tasting the gumbo are like, oh, this is actually really good. I didn't think this person could pull this off in 45 minutes. Guess what? They didn't. So I don't know if you haven't had gumbo before, but nope. they didn't. I don't Boy, have to taste it to know no, that that is some trash. It is not gumbo. <laughs> that, yeah. that it's is some not, dirty it's, water that, that you're tasting right it, now it, with some seasoning it cannot, in it. it can, you cannot cook gumbo in 30 minutes. No. It's not possible. It's physically not possible because... I don't know because science. I mean, like the the the, the, the starch the starch molecules will not the, will not suspend in the yeah the the starch molecules will not suspend in the water with the fat in thirty minutes. It just doesn't work. It can't. No. So I mean, like gumbo is is a long cooked dish. If I told a French bread, somebody told me one of these cooks, these chefs, they said I can make gumbo in thirty minutes. I'm gonna say I can make cocoa vein in thirty minutes too along with beef walling thing as well. That just takes 30 minutes, right? Yeah. That's fundamentally the same thing. You can't you can't make coke all vein in, in 30 minutes. You can't make beef bourguignon in 30 minutes. That's a that's a three, four hour dish. It's the same amount of time as a gumbo. Roughly. Yeah. yeah. You need it is to what it put is. in time. You need to time. put in the time. It cooking is love and you gotta put love into your dishes. You know, you just yes. gotta yes. nurture these dishes because you Cooking for people is is like is love, you know. It's it's a labor, culture, it's, a it's labor love. love. That's right. Exactly. What you, what you gotta so put you, in that pot? What you gotta put in that pot when you're cooking? Yeah, <laughs> no, that's the thing. What you put in you know, when somebody yeah. <laughs> all, all the way up to the ankle, Bob. That's right. Yeah, that's that's why you go to you go to somebody's house and they come. You know, and this is why 
I will say this, and this is true. I don't care what restaurant you're talking about. You will never have a better gumbo than you will have somebody that home cooked for you. It's mm-hmm. never. It is impossible. Because when someone, my mom makes gumbo, she babies that for hours. I mean, babies it. It's, it, 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 it's, it's such an intense process. And she focuses on it. There's nothing else. Nothing else exists in the world. It's the same thing when, when I make gumbo. That's, that's my whole focus. I don't focus on anything else. It has to be watched. It has to be babied. It has to be taken care of. And, and it's just not something you could really do in a restaurant. They don't have the time for that. They don't have the time to baby gumbo. gumbo. I, and that's how, yeah. and it's all saying, they say, oh, baby, cook that till it's tired. That's what you do with gumbo. <laughs> you have to cook it so long. And, and trust me, you will be rewarded for your efforts because it will it'll blow your mind how much putting that extra effort, that extra love into the gumbo really changes the whole product. Absolutely. There's there's certain dishes in, in multiple cultures that it takes time and there's nothing else that right. you can do to, to quicken the process. Go to, mm. you know, one of my favorite places in, in New Orleans, Cafe Lola. If you want some paella and you order it, That's, guess what? You're going to be spot. sitting at that table. Grab something to drink. Grab you a little appetizer because you're yeah. not getting your food for 45 you, minutes. You're going to be waiting. Exactly. You are going to wait. Every, and you know what? That's exactly what I want. I don't want to eat my food for another 45 minutes because I know what goes into the process of making it. If you're going to you, you're gonna eat gumbo, it's going to take a few hours. Don't eat it before no. then. No. Don't try to rush it and off with the stove. We, we've all been to Cafe Lola, and it's a fantastic restaurant. And, man, I tell you, the lady that cooks paella, that's the hardest working person in in, in the city <laughs> cooking. I mean, she is. She is rocking that out. She's cooking five paellas at a time. Yeah. And it is a process. And there's no cheating it. Nope. I, it's, it's like if, if somebody says, oh, I can cook brisket and I could cook, I could cook brisket in two hours. I'm going to call BS on you. It, it's just not possible. No. You know, it, it, there, there's a fast, certain you can't time. Cook it that fast. No. no, exactly. You can't. If you had to put, put a bow on this thing and, and really, really cover some of the, you know, the topics that, that we went over today. What, what would you like to leave the people with? We went over a lot. We did go. Uh, gumbo is a lot. And this is this is probably not going to be our last podcast on gumbo. This is kind of just like a an introduction to it. I think uh, we're going to cover future episodes, more of the technical aspects of cooking it, what you need, the process, the time. We're, we're going to cover that in later episodes. It, it can't all be covered in one. Oh, no. There's There's all kinds of things. This is kind of just an introduction to... Yeah the whole process but if you want to learn how to cook gumbo learn how to do it and just follow the recipes follow follow the guidelines take the time it's not a short dish but it's it's such a rewarding dish to cook because i can tell you the first time absolutely 100 percent nail your gumbo and it is 100 percent what you expected and what you want it's going to be a very happy moment for you and you're going to be super satisfied you might be tired but you'll be happy yeah. oh yeah my question is, did you put did you put tomatoes in that gumbo? Oh, oh that's right. No. Oh. oh. <laughs> that's oh. another. Now we asked me about oh, tomatoes and gumbo. Not this episode. No, that's, 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 that's going to take a few hours. We are going to talk about tomatoes and gumbo for a whole episode. I can guarantee you that. And the question about, I'll give a short answer. Do tomatoes go, go in gumbo? And the answer is sometimes. <laughs> Woo. How y'all feel about that? Sometimes I need everybody listening to this to come and and interact with us. We need to we need to hear from you. What what do you what do you think? Do tomatoes go in gumbo? Do you disagree with anything yeah. that we said today? Tell us yeah. about it. Please, please give us your opinion. We Defend your it. grandma. Oh, yes. That's, that's nostalgia. <laughs> Gotta get yeah. it. <laughs> Don't let me yeah, talk to you really- like that. Yeah, just just <laughs> let, let us know what you think. I mean, everybody has, but my I'm not gonna break what this the particular time we use tomatoes and gumbo, but we do use it sometimes, and it's a very particular case. Yes, very particular. We don't talk about so, it. <laughs> so I have a little a little quote to share with you guys. So this is a quote by Thomas Keller, and he says, "A recipe has no soul. You." As the cook must bring soul to the recipe. Exactly. 
Mm. Like you say, it's like it's, it's like a painting. Before you paint the picture, it's all just all it is just colors in a tube. Mm. So you have to you have to put it in there. So, and I say I say people learn the processes, learn the science, learn the reason about why things are done the way they're done. We're doing these. It's a very particular process to cook gumbo. It's not difficult. It just takes time, and you have to be specific. We 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 preaching today, y'all. I think we're gonna go ahead and. In this off, I'm gonna bring in a selection from the choir. Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. See, thank you everyone for joining thank us tonight and hope to see y'all again. Please leave your comments, questions, everything, and we will see you guys next time. All right. Thank you guys for listening. KCP, Brandon D, and your boy Barbecue Brand. Till next time. We out of here. <laughs> Peace. All right, guys. Bye.